So this week we've all been spending some bittersweet but mostly happy time looking back on Irish football history and celebrating the impact that Jack Charlton has had. We spoke with Paul Rouse about the historical impact of the team that reached the tournaments. The president, Michael D. Higgins, shared his reminiscences and talked about the great coming out of football on the national stage. And all of Jack's most important players have shared some lovely stories for us as well. But the one aspect that we haven't kind of covered on Off the Ball just yet is the political climate of the time. And I'm delighted to say, to help us sketch out where Ireland was in 1990, we're joined now by Tommy Gorman of RTE. Tommy, you're very welcome. Thanks for taking the call. Delighted to talk to you. Um, you had a fairly new role as European correspondent in 1990, but funnily enough, you weren't actually in Brussels in, uh, for the penalty shootout. You were in Dublin. What was going on? Yeah, um, I had gone to work in Brussels in uh, October of 1989, um, just before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and then from January the 1st of that year, for six months, Ireland took over the presidency of the European Union. And in those days, it really was a big deal because uh, you hosted summits in your country. It wasn't a question of going to the summit in Brussels, as Michal Martin is doing this week. The summits took place in the home of the host con in the home of the country that had a EU presidency at the time, the six month presidency. So Ireland, this small country, uh, was in pole position when huge historic shifts were taking place in Europe. German reunification was being uh, negotiated. There was a lot of tension over that. The Dutch, for instance, and the British had deep reservations about it. The idea of this huge new bloc emerging, a reunited Germany. Uh, and it fell to Ireland uh, and Charlie Hoy as Taoiseach to chair some of those meetings. So as it happened at the time of the penalty shootout, that particular game against Romania, you had the Brussels press corps camped at Dublin Castle and the actual match itself coincided with the holding of the summit. And there was a huge press tent with hundreds of journalists, uh, foreign crews, uh, written press uh, and people from all over the European Union who happened to be on our patch on that particular afternoon. So the game is on and people are watching it and in the meantime fairly serious matters of state are actually actively happening at that moment. Yeah um, I remember uh, Charlie Hawhey took this role very seriously you know you could see him puffing out his chest this was Ireland in the big time. And usually we were, we were minnows. We used to say that we were, there were four members of what you called the Pauper's Club. That's the phrase that the likes of John Downing and Sean Flynn, my colleagues in Brussels, Lord, Lord Rush Sean, that's a phrase we used to use. Uh, because Spain, uh, Portugal, Greece and Ireland were the poorest countries and the structural funds were beginning to flow. And at that time we were developing a reputation for using the money well. And the refurbishment at Dublin Castle was part of that largesse. So here was Charlie in pole position at these very, very difficult negotiations. Uh, and at the particular moment the match was going on, I remember he was briefing some of the written press. Now, I was a football supporter as well as a Norte e correspondent, and I knew what was going on. Um, and I remember actually finding out where they were. And I went into the room and oh, he was a bit startled when he saw me coming in and he said, what's wrong with you, Gorman? And I said, put on the television there. I said, the penalty shootout in, in, in the match. So I went over and I pushed on the television and the, the, the discussion in the room, their briefing of Charlie's great achievements, it stopped and people began to watch the penalties. And then, of course, Packy saved and O'Leary scored and everyone just went wild. And to be fair to Hawhey, he, he sees the moment. Uh, um, he saw what was, he appreciated what was going on. And he ran out into the courtyard uh, of Dublin Castle, where you had a lot of people in live camera positions. I'm nearly sure it was Sean Dykeman who was down presenting our 6-1 News at the time. And Hawhey danced a jig of delight uh, in the courtyard as this was happening. Uh, and I think from then on, the story for all the journalists. It ceased to become European politics or the latest moves in relation to Germany and the tensions about that and how the Irish were hosting the presidency. The story became book mad Dublin and Ireland and the crack that was going on. And of course, the pictures were everywhere uh, because you, all you had to do was walk out of Dublin Castle and the celebration was everywhere to be seen. And you didn't even have to leave the castle, Ger, because 
there was this huge press tent. Uh, and inside there, the journalists were doing their work, but also you had huge screens up. They were keeping an eye on the match. Uh, and you know, there's that absolutely magnificent uh, shot of John Healy, uh, who was a very, very famous Irish journalist. Uh, and he was there in the tent. He had been working as part of the presidency team on the, on the Hawhey books. And there's this wonderful shot of uh, John Healy seeing what was going on and the tears streaming down his face because he appreciated all the layers uh, of politics uh, and culture and history that were at play in those moments. Everybody who's ever watched Reeling in the Years knows exactly who you're talking about because it, it's just, it has, it has passed into the cult. So one of the things that we've been talking about here is with the younger members of our team going, uh, so you were born after this happened, what's it like? And, it, and they all talk about the guy crying on Reeling in the Years and it turns out it was actually somebody quite well known. I mean, I was... Yeah, like John Healy was, his background was, Healy was the first great political commentator of modern Ireland. He was from Charlestown in Mayo, reared in Snipegrass. The reason I know these things, he was my first boss. He gave me my first job. One of the reasons he hired me was he noticed uh, how there was a little patch in my trousers and it had been neatly darned. And he said, who darned a patch? And I said, my grandmother. And he says, kid, you come from Snipegrass. You'll be hungry too. So that was Healy. And Part of Healy's tradition was Healy wrote that wonderful series of articles in the Irish Times when Douglas Gageby was the editor about the denuding of the West, about emigration and the impact, not just on Charlestown and Mayo, but on the whole West of Ireland. So Healy became the champion uh, of uh, downtrodden uh, West of Ireland. Uh, and in some respects, he cared so much about the place that maybe at times he went into the tent, into the political tent to get things done. Uh, but Healy because of who he was and because he had this huge knowledge of our past, he appreciated that what was happening here was much more than a football match. Uh, this was Ireland taking its place on the European stage, achieving something by effort. And I think because Healy had grown up with emigration, because he had seen so many of the lads he was at school with in Charlestown leave, he knew but the guys who were playing for this team, some of them were the sons and the grandsons of Irish emigrants. He understood that we were being managed by an Englishman. And he understood that, you remember the old chance that we used to have, you'll never beat the Irish, that we were actually able to beat the English, we were able to get on with the English, and we were being managed by an Englishman. And some of the players were first and second generation Irishmen who had to go to England to get work. So he sort of appreciated the whole scale of that achievement. And he also realized that we were doing this in the full glare of the European audience. And we were taking our place as part of that Europe in footballing terms. And I think that when every time I see those pictures of Healy, that that's the level of emotional reaction that you had from him. He was seeing all of those things. And of course, what I didn't know then, and what he didn't know, what nobody knew was that was the summer of 1990. And in January 1991, at his home in Fortfield Terrace in Ratmines, where John Healy lived with his wife, Evelyn, and his sons and daughters, John Healy died in his sleep at the age of 61. Right. I didn't know that either. To be honest, I, I, all my life, I have assumed that these were pictures being beamed in from the RDS, and it was just some kind of um, organised, commercial, mass watching. But actually, it turns out, this is the European press corps here for one of the most important presidential things that happened. Like, there, so we have Margaret Thatcher here concerned about the power block emerging in Berlin, ultimately, as it, as it was going to be. Like, this is a fairly remarkable time in European history. Uh, it was. Uh, and, like, we were, you know, this place, the island beyond the bigger island. Uh, and we really were... OK, we had joined with the British and the Danes in uh, 1971. Uh, we had joined the European Union. Uh, was it 71 or 73? So we were young members. And the first decade or so 
uh, the people who really got the European experience were the farmers because we were integrated from the ground up because the farmers suddenly began to get decent prices for their products. But the next phase in the 80s was when European funding through the social fund and through Delors ideas and structural funds, it began to work its way into the infrastructure and into the education system. Uh, so the, they say the footprint, the European footprint was increasing and the impact of Europe was increasing and we were getting more into it. And in some respects as well, if you think about the 1980s, Ger, that's when we start to re-examine our uh, relationship with the British in a very serious way. Um, where we began to sit around the table with them as equals uh, and where we began to see we had some things in common with them. And in many respects, Charlton's football team reflected that new Ireland. It reflected, and like, we weren't just good time chancers. Yeah. Uh, we were a lot more than that. We were people who were willing, you know, the, the, the friendship that the foot soldiers, the real ambassadors of Ireland were the fans. Like, okay, the foreign affairs guys were doing their work, their politicians were doing their work, performing on the big stage. The football team was doing its work. But the people who did, I suppose, most of the person to person, the human stuff, were the fans who got to travel to Europe. But for the European press corps who came to Dublin, they saw a completely different Ireland. They saw this friendly place and it wasn't expensive in those days. And the friendship was genuine. I remember I, I had a cameraman called, a cameraman friend called Fred Nirak. He was a Belgian guy. And I remember he stayed out partying through the night. Uh, I know the two people who put him to bed that night. Fred was subsequently killed in friendly fire in the Iraq war. But I remember him saying to me that that was one of the best times in his life, that summit in Dublin. It, it, because so frequently the conversation is the Ireland football team started to do well and this somehow kick-started a, a, a new national identity. But actually, they're just they're coincidences that this is happening at the same time. You talk about the importance of the structural funds. Like, you know, we, we actually, I certainly remember being a kid and Abbott Reynolds coming back with, I think, eight billion. And this being this kind of mad, like, brilliant story that led the news for weeks, essentially. It was like, we're going to be okay. Something brilliant is happening here. Yeah, that Albert Reynolds stuff was, what, some 12 years later, that was the Edinburgh summit when all seemed lost. You'd had a very, very poor election. Uh, and then suddenly uh, they went for gold uh, and they got more than they were expecting. And that was used to entice Labour into government. But roll back the years to 1990, it was completely different. We were only at the very beginning of the journey. Like, immediately after that match, Hawhey... Uh, brought his ministers and clever how he, for political cover, he brought leaders of the opposition on the government jet as well. That was to go to the quarter final in Rome. And before the actual match took place, uh, there was a dinner in a place called the Villa Madama. It's in the hills uh, uh, over the Olympico Stadium. I know because I was there. Uh, I travelled to cover it. I was in the villa. Uh, and... Um, Hoy arrived with all his ministers and they were meeting their Italian counterparts immediately before the match. Uh, because this was, remember, this was uh, coming up to the end of June, start of July. Uh, and what the Irish were doing was they were handing over the baton, the European presidency, to who, who, who was going to take it over? The Italians took over from the Irish. So there was almost... <laughs> It, there was a synchronization going on. It was serendipity, the, the way the whole thing happened. So at this meal anyway, Hawhey's opposite number at that time was a guy called Giulio Andro Andriotti. And even by Italian standards, he deserved a role in The Godfather. <laughs> um, and Andriotti, uh, I, remember, I know this is true because Hawhey told me it, uh, that Andriotti, at the end of that evening, he gave him a special medal that had been minted just marking, say, his contribution during the Irish presidency to European politics. And this was Hawhey's memento. So you had that meal, and then the guys went down in their limousines, down to the Olympico Stadium for the match itself. And again, uh, I remember covering that. And because we were with the band, uh, in some respects, we were given this <laughs> great access point in the stadium. So I actually watched that match uh, from sent from the, the midfield area along the sideline on that say that red uh, that cinder turf area, um, where we could have good access to the vips shots of the vips in the stadium and where you could see every move in the game, and you know to my dying day 
I'll still see uh, the flight of uh, Donna Doni shot. And it came at Packy Bonner like a bullet because it swerved in the air. It had that sort of, you know, the way you hear in the comics, we used to see the banana shots. Well, this really did bend uh, really, really treacherously as it came towards Bonner. And then he could only parry it. And then Toto stuck it in. And then, of course, the Italians had Baresi and they had Maldini. They were, they were the experts in defending. Uh, and Ireland just couldn't get through. But it was, a, it was a fantastic time. I remember as well how he went into the dressing room afterwards. But it was like a morgue. Uh, and we filmed in the dressing room, but because we came from the exterior and we were into this place where you had all the sweat and all the steam from the showers and so on, and the bodies, the tired bodies, the warm bodies, I think that the stuff fogged up and those pictures never made air, but they've stayed in my mind since. As somebody who fully understands the football aspect of it, and I you was know, a, a died in the world League of Ireland aficionado, a big Sligo Rover supporter, um, what do you make of that easy narrative that we've always had about, oh, the football team kickstarts everything? Because it, it does seem as if our our ability to embrace the European adventure is actually the most important transformational moment in Ireland's history from one of those four countries that were the poorest nations to a country that suddenly is a modern, forward-thinking, progressive European nation. Um, well, um, a very wise person said to me once, you know, what is life but love and sport? Because uh, sport can capture all the most important important values that we have, the highs and the lows. It can represent everything. I think what happened then was that sport absolutely was pitch perfect in the way it summed up where we were and where we wanted to be. And it was the vehicle that allowed us to do those things. Like we really were trying to do them in business. We really were trying to do them in politics. We were trying to do them at so many levels. But I think sport allowed us, it gave us the confidence to make the breakthrough. Like we actually became good at it. And not only was it important in the European context and how we were perceived in European terms, but I'd go as far to say that it's actually the time when we re began to redefine our relationship with the British. Mm. Because when you think about it, like Jack Charlton was one of them. He had won the World Cup for them, but he became one of us. He got an Irish passport and he was extremely comfortable being Irish. You know, he loved going to Ballina. He loved fishing. Yeah, he loved going to uh, uh, Alan Cairns' uh, family home. Um, and the people that he was achieving this with, like, you know, John Aldridge had an English accent. So did Ray Houghton. Uh, and then we had another generation of fellas like Kevin Moore, you know, who would play GAA uh, for Dublin and who played for Manchester United. And we had Paul McGrath, and what did that say about our society? Uh, and all these wonderful things were happening. Uh, and as I look back on it now, maybe it's reading too much into it, but I actually think that we began to redefine our relationship with the British then, because we always had this love-hate thing, like we give out hell about them, we love to beat them, but we followed their football all the time. Uh, we couldn't give our footballers the proper platform in our own country. We couldn't give our people work in our own country, but they went to England. Mm. So we had this really, really complex relationship with them. And I think on the European political stage uh, and on the sporting stage, under Charlton, this was his great, great gift. We began to get comfortable with all those complexities and at times contradictions. But suddenly all of those things the, seem, the bits seem to fit, the jigsaw pieces seem to slot into place. And um, I really think that, I was talking to Elaine Flynn about this, Sean Flynn's widow, one of the days, and she said there were salad days, there were a lovely time in her lives. And I was, I was 34 at the time, and I can't really think of a better time in my life than then. It's a brilliant way to put it about the, the making peace with the contradictions that we have and beginning that process of healing with, uh, you know, with our... A colonial oppressor or our nearest neighbour, and actually, and Joe, sure, when you when you think of it as well, like um, the the Dutch prime minister at the time was rude lovers, and they had lived next door to the Germans. Uh, they had bad time during World War Two, and lovers was very very reluctant in terms of German unification. Thatcher took a stand on it. She had real real difficulties with it, and I remember afterwards, lovers 
some people thought he was a shoe in to become president of the European Commission. And he got bushwhacked and the job went to the last man standing, a guy called Jacques Santar from Luxembourg, who wasn't exactly uh, a star. Thatcher, uh, you'll remember, she subsequently went to, it was a meeting of the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It was on in Paris and it was to celebrate the, the ending of the Cold War uh, and fall of the Berlin Wall. And that night when she was in Paris, the vote was taken in the House of Commons where she was challenged by Heseltine and where she came out of the uh, the uh, British Embassy in Paris and she nearly fell over John Sargent. And that was the night that the mortal wound was suffered by her in that vote in, in the House of Commons. So that German reunification issue, it became extremely difficult for some people. Uh, and, you know, there were consequences, say, in European politics. But from an Irish perspective, all those consequences were positive. As this small country, what, th four million people at the time, during our six-month presidency, important decisions were taken. And the money we were getting in structural funds, it was entirely in keeping with the Delore philosophy of you give the largesse to the places that need it most and they in turn will come up. Well, that investment that was made in the Irish as members of the European Union and the ideology that we bought into, that was returned in spades during those years. Yeah, 100%. It really paid off. Tommy, like all great pieces, there's new information and new details. We've spoken about John Healy and a whole new generation are going to now be familiar with his. There was one other piece that I, in your, um, one other line in your piece that I just wanted to, to draw attention to, and that was you were on the, the plane with Ray Tracy and he talked about the generosity of John Giles. I just thought this was... Uh, Phenomenal story, and I hadn't heard it before. Yeah, um, there were a few people uh, doing packages at the time. We had actually gone to Recchi, Italy. Talk about a, a lovely gig. We went to Italy in uh, April to look at the facilities that Irish fans would be using. You know, we got to Gigi Riva, Riva territory. We got to Sicily, we got to Sardinia, and then we got back to Rome. And it was a wonderful trip. But I got to know, you know, some of the travel agents who were doing, you know, preparing packages at that time. Uh, and Michael Caslin from 747 was one of them. And Ray Tracy had a very big, successful business at the time. And as luck would have it, I was sitting beside him uh, on the plane when we were going after the Romania victory over to Rome for the for the match against Italy for the quarter final. Uh, and of course, I knew him uh, as an Irish legend, you know, who just never stopped trying. I knew him and disliked him uh, from, you know, the Shamrock Rovers involvement. Um, well, it was such an honour to be in his company. And we got chatting and we were talking about football. And um, he told me a wonderful story about Johnny Giles that, you know, has coloured my view of the two men since. Um, Ray said that, you know, he had been around a lot of clubs uh, in football and he tried to do his best to amass some something of a nest egg. And um, he said that he made a few bad investments. From memory, I think he talked about maybe at some stage investing in a laundry or something, but it hadn't gone well. And he got this phone call from Johnny Giles. And of course, they had played together uh, and they knew each other quite a long time. And he said they talked about a few things and then... Uh, Johnny Giles said to him, well, uh, how are things? And Tracy said to me that his pride wouldn't let him say, well, they're not great. So he said, oh, everything's going grand. Yeah, fine, fine, everything grand. So Johnny Giles listened, and then he just said to him quietly, not in any sort of a, uh, I suppose, a forceful way. He said to him, look, um, I'm uh, going to put a check in the post to you tomorrow. It's going to be blank. You can fill it in for, and I think he mentioned a number of figures, and he said to him, uh, don't worry about any interest and pay it back whenever. And that was that. Uh, and uh, Tracy said that it was just the absolute lifeline that he needed, that it was the real mark of a gentleman. And he also said the way in which it was done, you know, that he was left his dignity uh, by the conversation. And he said... That's how, you know, that's, that was why he had such respect for Johnny Giles. I thought it was a lovely story. It was, it really was, and it's beautifully told. And, Tommy, you've been great with your, your time, so generous. Salad days, I think, is the, the phrase that we're going to take away from this. Uh, absolutely, and what, a, what an amazing bursting in and telling Hawley, right, st stop telling everybody how great you are. 
penalty shootout is on. Oh, I, Jesus, I don't know if I was as assertive as that. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was just, it was just instinctively, I went in there and, you know, sometimes in life, um, when it's a choice between trying something or doing nothing, you know, most of the time you're best to try it. Tommy, you great stuff. Thanks a million for sharing that with us. Cheers, sir. That's uh, Tommy Gorman there, brilliant raconteur, telling us what it was actually like to be around in 1990 and covering that and, like, what a trip to be essentially on the touchline for the biggest game, it turns out, in Irish football history. It has been a week where we've been relaxing into some memories and it's been a sad week, but it's also been a week of celebration of Jack Charlton's life. Have a listen. We've had some great days and great nights and good memories. I hope that the people of Ireland have got... I know that they've got the memories. I know they cherish them and I know that they've enjoyed the days that when they've done something that they've never done before. They go to a World Cup as part of it a couple of times. They've enjoyed that in the European Championship. Thank you for the days Those endless days, those sacred days you gave me the president phoned me and said, uh, would you like, uh, the, the job is yours if you'd like it. And I said, I would like it. End of story. I won't forget a single day, believe me. Well, you know, we're 28 to 1, I think, we're quoted as, and uh, we're not expected to do anything in this competition. We just hope to surprise a few people. This kick by Sansa and goes Aldridge, and Houghton! one nil. Nowadays, you see, they've changed it. Everybody in Europe does a little bit of what we did. Everybody in Europe. But they've changed the name, the FIFA guys. They call it pressing. Because they don't want to tell us that we started it. We call it putting people under pressure. Malta nil, Republic of Ireland two. And history has been made in Malta. Jack Charlton achieving his victory achieving his ambition. We've qualified for the go to Italy and we've done it ourselves. I'm absolutely delighted, not only for me, but for all the fans. The nation holds its breath. Yes! And then I saw David coming, and I'm not the greatest believer in centre-backs taking penalties. And then David went back, put the ball down again, and went, sent the goalkeeper on way and put it in, and it went fantastic. Well, there, we're in the last state for the first time in my history, and it's magic. I'm, I'm delighted <laughs> for the lads. And good luck to the people back home. Right. Hope they have a good party. Bird came to me and he said, Our boss, he said, when we get to Rome, this, you'll get us in to see the Pope, won't you? Well, that was where the final was going to be played, and I don't think they're a prayer again, but the final. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> We prepared properly. We had a little bit of sun. We ate well. And we drank very little. We're going to change that tonight. You see, you see, the <laughs> It's a bit like religion, isn't it? And, 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 and football's a bit like religion, isn't it? And, and Jack, is, he'd be like a sort of, I suppose, he'd be like a pope or a bishop or something. He would. But easy, onto it comes Hout, and Hout with a shot, and it's there! I went into the players, and we, we, we just sat in the dressing room, and we were getting changed and everything, and then somebody come and said to me, would you come out back on the pitch? I said, what for? He said, the crowd won't go home. I, I just remember, I just cried. I, you know, it was, it was time for me to leave. I'd been there for 10 years and it was time for me to leave. And, uh, and I did.